Uh, praise God. Um, you know, it's really good that we're here today um, in the house of prayer. You know, sometimes we get used to it and we don't see the blessing. We don't see how graceful and how merciful it is that we're here today. You know, when we were driving here, we saw, uh, lift, you know, different innocent um, kids just walking around in costumes going trick-or-treating. You know, not understanding, you know, how bad that is, not understanding how demonic and how satanic it is. But today we have an opportunity to hear the, oh, God's word. Today we have an opportunity to be in His presence. Today we have an opportunity to pray, an opportunity that those kids don't know about, an opportunity that those kids don't have, an opportunity um, that we receive today they don't have yet. Dear friends, and just before we stand, uh, just before we get into the word of God, if we can all stand up and let's say a prayer um, for the city. Let's say a prayer uh, for the state so God would bless it, so God would reveal himself to the state and that God would come with his presence because like Alec already said earlier, we're here to pray. We're here to be in God's presence. We're here today to encounter Jesus Christ. So let's say a prayer for the city and for the rest of the service. Lord, we come before you today and... First, we want to thank you, God, that today, under your grace and mercy, we are here, God. God, bless the state. God, bless the city, God. Bless those kids, God, that don't know the truth and the truth, Lord God. Hallelujah. God bless the city, bless this place, God bless the people that are gathered, God. And I pray that you move today in this place, God. And I pray that you move in this place today, Lord. Reveal yourself to these families, God, to those people, Lord God, that you use this church as a light that is on top of a hill to shine in high schools, in middle schools, elementary schools, in colleges at work, God. That you bless this youth for your glory, God. And may the anointing of the Holy Spirit rest upon this service today, God. May your spirit move today, God. That you speak today, that we don't move in human wisdom and human understanding. But Lord, fill us with your spirit, that we would be vessels, God, that are filled with your presence and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to do the impossible to do what men can do, Lord, but you do it in your power, you do it in your grace, you do it in your anointing, God, to bring life, to bring revelation, and to bring your spirit into this place, God, we ask you in the name of Jesus, amen. We can be seated. You know, when we were, we were just coming from Missouri, and the youth was telling us how this youth is a lot better than theirs, I don't know what they meant by that. Uh, I guess they were here recently and they really enjoyed your guys' presence and I'm sure that we will have the same kind of experience. And, you know, I truly do believe that the Holy Spirit is in this place. I truly believe that, you know, these trips and, you know, the visitations, they're not for, they're not for no reason. It's not because we want to travel some 20 hours and, uh, you know, visit because we have nothing else to do. But I do believe that God, He ordains things to happen for a reason. I believe that God, He wants to do something in the youth, that God wants to do something in the church, in this country. You know, a lot of times we look at a church and we think, man, it's this way and it shouldn't be like that. But, you know, a lot of times people remember what happened before and how it used to be before. And especially God, He really moved in this country. A lot of times we remember Ukraine and we remember Russia, but God, He really, really moved in this country. Dear friends, He moved in this country in a way that we can't imagine. He moved in this country in such a revival and such things happened in this country where people had no hands and on the spot people would see, you know, bones grow and skin grow. You know, and this happened in California in the city today where abortion is legalized, where homosexuality is all right and they're preaching that or teaching that I should say in elementary schools. They probably don't, I don't know if they have that here, but in that city, I mean in that state they started to accept that. You know, but once there was such a revival and such an awakening, but a lot of times we remember that and we kind of dwell on the past and we kind of say, well, it was so good back then because they had such people back then that prayed and they did all these things. But today God, He wants to do the same thing. Today God, He wants to pick up people for His glory. Today God, He wants to light up the hearts with the fire of the Holy Spirit to do something in this country again. Not to do it in 20 years 
or in 30 years or in five years, but today. But today. I know there's a lot of probably Slavic people that know this book. Пробуждение начинается с меня. Revival starts from me. Awakening starts from me. The change starts from me. It doesn't start from a pastor. It doesn't start from my parents. It doesn't start from my sibling. It starts from me and me personally. And that's what God wants to do. He doesn't just want to do something in the service. God wants to do something in our hearts individually. God wants to do something inside of us individually. Dear friends, I believe that the presence of God can come in this place and we're going to be weeping and we're going to be crying. But if something doesn't happen in our hearts personally, dear friends, a lot of times that doesn't last long. A lot of times people go from conference to conference, uh, from service to service, from a preacher to preacher and they get lit up and they come in front, they cry and stuff and then they go back. But God wants to do something personally. God wants to reveal himself personally. God wants to speak to us personally. God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Your friends, God wants to say, you know, I'm the God of Sergei or Anna or Julie, Tom or Sarah. I mean, I don't know your names. You know, I'll get to know them a little bit later. But, you know, God wants to say that he's your personal God. Not the God of your... Uh, ancestors, not the God of your forefathers, the God and the grandparents, the God of your grandparents that sat in prison and in jail and because of them maybe today you have some sort of blessing that other people don't. But today God wants to be your God. God wants to reveal himself to you personally. That you're not going to say, yeah, I believe in God because I was told that. But God today, He wants to reveal Himself to you and open something to you that you're going to be able to hang on to and leave this place and say, today I've come to an understanding and the realization that God is my God. He's not the God of my pastor. He's not the God of my evangelist or my deacon or my parents or my sister or my brother or my uncle or my aunt or some person in Ukraine or some person in Russia, but He's my God. And I'm boastful about that. And I rejoice today because I understand that He's my God. That He loves me and He knows me. And He's there and He wants to speak to me. Your friends, God wants to do something today. Not just as a whole. But individually and personally. God wants to do something. Your friends, and God is not looking at... You know, the things you might be stuck in or your family background. He doesn't check your resume and see where you come from. Because if he did that, dear friends, a lot of us would not be in this place today. A lot of us would not have the grace and the mercy of God. If God would check our resumes and God would check our backgrounds and God would check things and he would act upon that, we would never be here. But dear friends, God does something differently. God wants to do something in our lives today. You know, personally, I don't come from a Christian family and that shows, you know, the grace and the mercy of God. You know, I never had life. I thought I did. I thought I had everything I needed. I thought I was something in this world. I thought I achieved something. I thought that I was somebody in front of other people. But dear friends, I had no life, even though I thought I had life. You know, I thought I was happy. I didn't feel empty. I didn't feel depressed. I didn't feel sad. I thought everything I was doing was good. Like what I mean by that, I enjoyed it. I, I didn't see that, you know, well, I'm destroying my life. I didn't see it that way. But I never understood. You know, I never had a purpose in life. I never had a point in life. I was living because I had to live. You know, we wake up because we wake up. We go to sleep because that's a natural thing. It's a cycle. And I was living in my own cycle. I was doing my own thing. I was living my own kind of life. I never, I never understood that there's something else. I never knew that there's a point to life. I never understood that there's a, you know, purpose for your and my life. I never understood that. But dear friends, when the revelation of Jesus Christ came, when the understanding of God came, not because of Sunday school, not because of somebody else, but because of Jesus Christ, because of His sacrifice, because He died and He resurrected, because He, out of His grace, decided to reveal Himself, everything changed. You know, everything started to change. Your mind, your, vo your viewpoint, your everything. 
I don't know if you're like this. I remember when I would come to church before because maybe I wanted to see somebody. Because maybe I wanted to hang out. Because I knew certain people that lived in the world, but they would come to church too. And I knew them. But I remember I would sit and like my body would hurt. Like I couldn't wait to get out. Like I, it's like as if my bones hurt. It, I, I couldn't sit. I'm like, man, I got to move. I got to do so. I just can't sit here. This is boring. I, I don't know how people do this. I don't know how people live a Christian life because they're so secluded and, you know, this, I can't, and a bunch of things. But when Jesus revealed himself, the outlook on Christianity changed. The views, they changed. You know, it's no longer, and I'm not saying that this is me. I'm saying that that's what Jesus does, that you don't sit at a service longer and your body hurts and you're like, man, I can't wait to move. I can't wait to do something. You sit and you enjoy you, know, you don't see that Christianity is boring. You don't see that, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. But it comes out of your heart because you understand that that's what you want to do. It's no longer something that you are, but it, it comes out of your heart. Because something changed when the revelation of Jesus Christ comes. Dear friends, and one of the things that as a church of Jesus, that as a youth today, we lack, it's the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. We know Him, we've heard about Him, we've seen Him in pictures and Christian literature, and we've maybe seen some kind of cartoon about Moses and about Noah, but it's a personal revelation of Jesus Christ that changes life. Dear friends, it's not anything else but the revelation of Jesus Christ. We might never drink, we might never smoke, we might never commit adultery, but if we do not have the revelation of Jesus Christ, we don't have life. And if we do not have the revelation of Jesus Christ, we are not saved. Because it is Jesus Christ alone that saves us. Because many Pharisees never drank, never did certain things, but they were not saved. And he tells, Jesus tells the Pharisees, he says, the harlots and the tax collectors are entering paradise heaven before you. These people, these women that slept around, that sold their body for prostitution, that would shave their heads. And Jesus saying that one day, they're entering first. And the Pharisees look, what are you talking about? That doesn't make sense. Right? That doesn't. It doesn't make sense. But because somebody received the revelation of Jesus Christ and they gave their hearts to God, everything changed. Dear friends, and that's the one thing that the Lord wants to do is He wants to reveal Himself to us. If you guys have your Bibles, if you want to open up to Acts chapter 22. You know, and one thing that I heard before is that if you read the book of Acts and you get to the end chapter, it never says amen. It never has like a conclusion to the book. There's no prayer. There's no concluding, you know, uh, that we say that Apostle Paul did it in his other letters. We don't see that. And they say because today the works of the Holy Spirit and the movement of the Holy Spirit, his acts are continuing today. Dear friends, and as we are here today, let's not think how God moved in the book of Acts, but let's believe and expect that God wants to move today too. That God wants to do something today too. You know, and the book of Acts, a lot, is about Apostle Paul. And you know, his life starts in chapter 9, I believe, when he received, uh, the, I mean, it starts a chapter before when he was standing before Stephen uh, as they were killing him. But, you know, the journey of Apostle Paul is throughout the scripture. And chapter 9 is his beginning walk with the Lord. When he received this personal revelation, when he, his eyes were open, when he understood who he stood before. And there comes a moment when he, these people that were once his brothers, they were once the people that he had a common faith with. The people that supported him, people that respected him, people that feared him. Now they're trying to stone him. Now they're trying to kill him. Now they're trying to give him up to death. And in Acts chapter 2, he stands before these Israelites, these Jewish scribes and these, you know, prominent people. And he's trying to tell them who he was and what Jesus did. And let's start from, let's just start from verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. 
And when they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia and brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you are all are today. And you might ask, you know, why are we reading this scripture? It's a little bit random. But Apostle Paul, he's trying to deliver a message to these Hebrews. And he's telling them who he was. You know, in the book of Galatians, he says, I'm from, uh, you know, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, you know, circumcised on the eighth day. And he's telling them everything that happened in his life. And he said one thing. He said that I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You know, and this person, maybe to us it's some strange name. Maybe to us it's like, who is this person? You know, why, why does Apostle Paul even mention him? But at their time, that man had a big name. And his name meant a lot. He wasn't some random person, but he was the best teacher of the law. The best teacher in all Israel. He had his own school and the best people went to it. You know, the law that was taught for the forefathers, he, this school carried the strictest law. And Apostle Paul is saying, I was the most zealous for it. You know, he says, I, I was blameless before the law and I was sitting at his feet. And he's trying to tell them, hey, look, I was at this teacher. I'm his disciple. I learned everything from him. And when they're listening to, these, to this uh, person, they're hearing his name. To them, it means a lot. You know, and this teacher who was teaching Apostle Paul, or back then his name was Saul, he was teaching him the law, he was teaching him the scripture, he was teaching them the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, and he was making them memorize all these things because he understood that one day he's going to raise up and he's going to be a Pharisee and he's going to need to pass on the law and he's going to need to teach others. And so this teacher who everybody knew, who everybody respected, who was the top person in Israel according to teaching the law, he was teaching Saul. And Saul wasn't some random person. Saul wasn't some person that was illiterate in scripture. He wasn't some person that did not know what was written in the Old Testament. He was a man that knew the scripture. He was a man that knew the promises of God. He was a man that from his childhood, he heard about Jehovah. He heard about God ever since he was little. These things were invested into him. It was done without his choice. Nobody asked for his opinion. They chose him and they placed him. And ever since he was little, they were teaching him the scripture. And so you can imagine this man is growing up and he has all this knowledge. He has all this understanding of scripture. He has all this understanding of the promises of God. He understands that one day the Messiah is going to come. He understands that one day, you know, the, the temple is going to be destroyed. One day he understands that the, maybe Antichrist is going to He knows all these things because he's knowledgeable. And he understands because this teacher taught him the word of God. This teacher taught him the scripture. He taught him to believe everything according to the word of God. He didn't teach him heresy. He didn't teach him about a false God. He didn't teach him about idols. He feared God and he respected God and he honored God. He wasn't a person that would come and lift up his feet and say, you know, what's up? He, he feared and he had an awe before God. He had a deep respect and he feared the Lord. You know, and this teacher taught him everything correctly, everything according to scripture, everything he could have ever known, not about this book, but before the New Testament. He knew everything that there is. He knew every single thing. But dear friends, there's one thing that the teacher did not deliver to him. There's one thing that he missed out on. There's one thing that this Saul, this man of great wisdom and knowledge and intelligence and intellect, there's one thing that he never received. There's one thing for years of his life and he was already over 30 years old when he received the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's one thing that he didn't have grown up. There's one thing that he never understood even though he grew up in the temple, even though he grew up by the feet of the greatest teacher, even though he heard scripture throughout his life and he never drank and smoked and committed adultery he kept himself pure one thing and that was the revelation of Jesus Christ and that was an understanding of who Christ is 
That was the understanding of the whole point of this book. Everything that the teacher was trying to teach him, everything that the teacher was trying to show him, he missed the point. He never understood what it was all about. He never had the revelation of Jesus Christ. The next scripture we're going to open up to, it's going to be Luke chapter 10. And you guys know this story. It's about two sisters. I'm not sure if there's two sisters that are relatives here. But this was a story about two sisters and their brother Lazarus. And at this moment, if we read, and I think it's in the book of John, it said that Jesus loved them. It said that Jesus, he cared for these people. And if you don't know much about and not that I know, but from what I've heard, and if you, their culture is still like that to an extent. But women in that culture, in the Hebrew culture or the Islamic culture, are very low. They were not allowed to eat when men are eating. They're not allowed to be in the same room with men. They were there to bring food, bring everything, and just leave. And so the women were very looked down upon in that culture. They were not allowed to speak. They were as servants and pretty much almost uh, you can consider them to an extent, not with the actual, but somewhat like slaves. And so Jesus, he walks into this house and he loved Lazarus, he loved Martha, and he loved Mary. And you have to understand that in order for a woman to be around a rabbi and to be around a teacher is not common in Israel. It's not allowed in Israel. When the woman touched Jesus and she got healed, do you know why she got scared? Because she thought she's going to die because she touched a rabbi. Because she touched the teacher of the law being unclean. They killed people like that. If a man touched him, not so much. But if a woman, it was a different story. So I hope you understand the, the, the view and what's going on and how the Jewish people looked at women. They were not even close to how men are. We're all on the same page, so we can move on, yeah? And so, in this story, Jesus is sitting, and he's teaching probably the disciples and other men. And we're going to read from verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. That's what women did. That's the, their understanding and their view. What Martha is doing is correct. What she's doing is right. That's normal. That's how they should have been. And that's what they should have been doing. But for some reason, she had an odd sister. A sister that didn't fit in. A sister that was a little bit different. She didn't care if there were men. She didn't care if there was disciples. She didn't care if Jesus was a rabbi and she's not supposed to be next to him. She cared for one thing. She wanted to sit at his feet. And she wanted to listen to what Jesus had to say. Dear friends, and we read two scriptures. And we read about two people. And both of these people sat at somebody's feet. Both of these people sat next to somebody. Both of, both of these people sat at the feet of a man. And we should ask ourselves a question. Now, whose feet are we sitting at today? Whose feet are we sitting at today? Dear friends, because we can sit next to the greatest teachers. We can sit next to the greatest pastors. We can sit next to the greatest evangelists. And we can learn the scripture. We can go through Sunday school twice if we have to. We can go to a seminary. We can get the knowledge of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the books that are not included in the Bible. We can memorize scripture from top to bottom. We can memorize chapters and stories and everything. And if somebody comes and asks us, yeah, we're going to be, yes, this is in the Bible. And this is what the Bible says. And it's in this chapter and in this verse, on this page and this line. 
but never have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. But this woman, your friends, please listen to this woman. She never went through education. This woman never sat at the feet of a rabbi. She never sat by the feet of a person that is able to teach her scripture. The woman never had an opportunity like that. They were never able to come and just sit and be next to a rabbi and receive some kind of knowledge or some kind of understanding of scripture. They never had that. They didn't memorize the scripture. They didn't know the depths of scripture. But this woman had the revelation of who Jesus is. She had the understanding of who Jesus Christ is and she knew him. But there was a man that grew up from his childhood learning the scriptures but never had the revelation of who he is. Never had the revelation of his God, the God that he's serving, the God who he thinks he's persecuting the people for pleasing God. He never had a revelation. You guys don't need to open this but this is John chapter 4. We're going to be coming to prayer soon. But you guys know the story of a Samaritan woman. This woman who the Jews despised, uh, Jesus came to them. He came to her specifically because that was the will of God. And when she received the revelation of who Christ is, she received the revelation of the Messiah, that Jesus is the one to come. It says in scripture that she went back to the city and she testified. And she said, come and see the one who told everything about me. Is he not the one? And she went and she shared about this Jesus that she just met. Your friends, she had no education. She didn't go through Sunday school. But at one moment of encountering Jesus, she received a revelation that changed her life. They changed their views. They changed their mind. But we're going to concentrate on one verse. Verse 42. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said. For we ourselves have heard him and we know that this indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world, the song that we were just singing. Dear friends, these people first believed because this woman came and told them about the Messiah. They have never met him. They have never encountered him. They don't know what he looks like. They don't know what he smells like. They don't know his hair color. They don't know what he's about. The only reason they believed it because there was a person that told them. That's the only reason. They never encountered the Messiah personally. They only encountered him because there was a woman that came and told them. But verse 42, they come and I, I believe they're joyful and they're boasting in this. In a good sense, it says if we boast, we boast in the Lord. And I believe they're boasting in the Lord and they say, you know, we don't believe because Somebody came up and shared something about Jesus. We don't believe in him because you said something. We don't believe in him because somebody came behind the pulpit and shared about this man who calls himself the Savior. Who came from heaven to earth to die and on the third day he resurrected. And he's sitting on the right hand of God. We don't not believe because somebody just shared. But we believe because we received the revelation. We, our eyes were opened. Woman, we don't believe because you just told us some three, four days ago. But we believe because we personally heard from him. We heard his voice. We heard what he, he spoke to me. And now he's not the God that you are talking about. He's our God. He's my God because he spoke to me. Dear friends, you remember the seven sons of Skeva who tried to go cast out a demon. It says this, we cast you out in the name of Jesus who Paul preached about. They don't even know Jesus. We know him because we heard of him. Because some, name, some man named Paul talked about him. So now today we're trying to do something in his name. We don't even know him. But these people are rejoicing. And they're saying, yes, we have personally received. We have personally have heard. We have personally heard 
from Jesus. He spoke to me. The Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Dear friends, they didn't have New Testament back then. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They didn't have that. Dear friends, John, John's epistle was one of the last, I mean John's gospel is one of the last ones that was written. They didn't have what we have today. But they received a revelation. Their eyes were opened. We're going to read one more scripture. And we're going to be coming to prayer. It's going to be Galatians chapter 1. This is a chapter where Apostle Paul somewhat testifies about himself. <clears throat> testifies about where he came from. Testifies about his past somewhat life. How he received what he received and that he was zealous for the traditions of the fathers. But he points something out. He says this, for I neither received it, verse 12, from men, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, Apostle Paul was a man that was blameless before the law. Dear friends, there's not a single person in this room that can, is able to say those words, I am blameless before the law. Nobody can say that in this room. Dear friends, but this man had the boldness to say that I am not blameless before the law. But he missed one thing in his life. And when he received the revelation of Jesus Christ, his whole life changed. Everything inside of him changed. His mind changed. His view on life changed. The perp, everything changed. He became a different person. Because at one moment, he encountered Jesus Christ. Dear friends, we need to ask ourselves, every single one of us, can I today say, you know, this is an opinion. People believe what they believe. You know, we have our faith. But ever since people are little, they've been told without them repenting that they, Jesus, that they know Jesus and that they're the children of God, but they never encountered Christ and they were never born again. The Bible says if you're born of the flesh, you're flesh. If you're born of the spirit, you're spirit. And in order for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must first be born again. Just because we're born into a Christian family doesn't mean we're born again. Just because we were born in a Christian family doesn't mean we received the revelation. Dear friends, and that's where life is. That's where salvation is. It's in the revelation of Jesus Christ. If Apostle Paul never received the revelation of Christ, he would have never been saved even though he sat at the greatest teacher, at the feet of the greatest teacher. Even though he knew the scriptures, he knew the law, he knew everything there is to say about Moses and Abraham and Noah and all the great men and all the great prophets that would have never saved him. That knowledge would have never justified him and redeemed him because he never had the revelation. He never knew Jesus. He never knew who Jesus was. He never had an encounter with him. He never met him personally. He thought he did. He thought he believed. He assumed it. But when he received the revelation, everything else changed. Everything else changed. Dear friends, let's ask ourselves, have we encountered Christ? Have we received the revelation of Jesus? Do we know the gospel? Or do we know it because we were taught it in Sunday school? Or do we know it because it's the faith of our father, of our mother, of our pastor, or some preacher that comes? Who cannot save us? No preacher, no evangel, no, no, nobody can save us except through Jesus Christ. Except through the revelation of Him. Dear friends, at the judgment day, like the brother was saying, the pastor cannot justify you. The evangelist cannot justify you. A preacher, a street preacher, a prophet, somebody who prophesies, they cannot justify us. Only Jesus, only He can. Only His sacrifice and the revelation of Him. Dear friends, and as you ask yourself these questions, can we rise up? 
As we ask ourselves, have I received the revelation? Have I received the truth? Have I received these things? Have this happened to me? Dear friends, if it hasn't happened, Jesus wants to do that. It is, the Bible says, it is His will that everybody comes to the knowledge of the truth. That everybody repents. That everybody would be saved. It's His desire. It's His will. He wants that. Your friends, so if you're sitting like the sister was testifying, I'm not worthy. No one's worthy. Not a single person in this room has earned God's approval. But if we come to God with our approval and our works, we will never be able to receive anything because it's by works and it's by law. And if you mess up the law once, you're, uh, you messed up the whole law. That's what the, that's what the scripture says. But God wants to reveal himself through grace, through faith in Christ. Dear friends, and I believe, you know, uh, that the pastors and the ministers of the church, that they're burdened, they're praying. And I believe that the grace of God is in this place and He's moving. And I believe that God wants to do something in our lives today. Do we don't just leave these doors the same way we came in? Dear friends, it's time to be open before the Lord and say, God, yes, maybe I've heard about you my whole life, but I have no relationship with you. I come to you, I find it boring. God loves sincerity. Dear friends, if we come before God and we don't know who God is and we tell him how holy he is, he doesn't need to hear that he knows he's holy. He knows he's righteous. He knows he's just. He knows he's mighty. He knows himself. But he wants us to know who he is. Let's say if we don't know Jesus, reveal yourself to me. Because my life depends on that. I need to know who you are, not because somebody tells me. Because like the Samaritan woman, but I need you to come and speak to me. I need to know you. Open my ears, open my eyes, do something in me because I don't have the revelation. I've been born in church. I've been born in a Christian family. I went to Sunday school. I teach in teen school. I help out. I'm in ministry. I'm a, but I don't know you. I don't have a revelation. I've never encountered you. I don't have life inside of me that other people have. I don't have the fire inside of me. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I shouldn't be like, I don't know what to do. Dear friends, and the Bible says that God came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captives free. He came to open the eyes of the blind. Dear friends, that Jesus did not come for the righteous, but he came for sinners to call them to repentance. If we're so righteous, he didn't come for us. If we're so righteous, then don't expect him to come to you. Because you're already righteous. You already think you have it. You already think you achieved something. Dear friends, if you're in this place and you think, well, because of this, I can approve, get a God's approval, you're wrong. He'll pass you by. Because he didn't come for the righteous. He came for the lost. It says, I came to seek and to save the lost. I came for those that are desperate in me. Those prostitutes and those drug addicts. Those people that are in. I came to save them. I came to reveal myself because they know that they're in need of me. They know they're in need of me. And the greatest strategy of the church is that they no longer think they need Jesus. They no longer think that they, th they think they're good. They think they achieved something. But that's the worst condition. That is the worst. It's not being a prostitute. It's not being a... It's to be blinded and not to see the truth. That is the worst condition. Dear friends, and the Holy Spirit is in this place. And the Holy Spirit is working in my and in your hearts today. He's urging us and he's trying to speak something, dear friends. And let's not pretend and say this word is not for me. Dear friends, if something's stirring in your heart, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's trying to do something in you. Don't put on a mask. Don't try to say you know it all. But say, God, I need you today. Speak to me. Reveal yourself to me. Jesus, I need you. Dear friends, let's come to prayer and seek the face of God. Let's pray.